Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service production providing our viewing and listening audiences in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Now here is your host, Fred Martino. And thank you so much for joining us. We are beginning Your Legislators and we'll be with you for the entire legislative session. We have a very good start to the program in our studios this week. I'm pleased to welcome Senator Steve Fishman. He recently announced that he's running for re-election next year in District 37. Steve, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, it's a pleasure, thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. I wanna start out with uh, the top issue for many folks, which of course is job creation. What should the state legislature do to encourage that? Uh, well, there are a couple things that people don't typically think about that I, I think are important. Um, one is dealing with our real estate and our foreclosure situation. Uh, people quickly forget that uh, what precipitated this economic downturn was a lot of shenanigans in the financial markets uh, having to do with uh, mortgages and that kind of got us on this whole downhill slide. And what's keeping us there is we have people who have a hard time paying their bills, there aren't consumer dollars to spend, uh, and particularly they can't keep up with their mortgages. Um, so actually I'm working on a piece of legislation going f uh, uh, for this next session that would require uh, mediation for certain mortgages that might be uh, salvageable um, see if we can kind of clean up some of the abuses that have been going on in the whole foreclosure system. When houses don't foreclose, neighborhoods stay more robust. If you can renegotiate a mortgage rather than forcing a family to leave, uh, that's a plus for the economy, that's a plus for consumer confidence. And um, while it's not a direct subsidy, it's an incredibly powerful uh, economic stimulator. Um, so I think that's number one that we have to do. Uh, number two, we need to look a little bit at the tax code. In um, New Mexico, and I have a bill that I'm introducing on this as well, uh, we have this problem of tax pyramiding, uh, which basically is our, look, if you look at our gross receipts tax, many businesses um, have to pay a gross receipts tax on services provided by other businesses. In most states, what happens is there's a sales tax and that is only levied on a final sale to a consumer, not on transactions between businesses. Um, so uh, there's some things we can do. There's a lot of tricks and traps in this, uh, but I put together some proposals and I believe the governor is putting together some proposals to relieve the tax uh, pyramiding problem, which taxes a business before it ever earns an income and creates a lot of uncertainty and really makes them reluctant to grow and invest. Um, so I think we need to do some, some stuff with that. Uh, in my case, I'll be introducing some, there are some tax giveaways we do to certain special interests uh, that I would basically get rid of in order to fund um, eliminating some of the tax pyramiding so that we don't tax at a time when it most hurts economic activity and we do tax at a time when it's appropriate. Um, the third thing we need to do is cautiously uh, look at uh, certain kinds of subsidies for very special projects. Now, whenever people talk about getting the economy going, they always want to invent a tax break or a subsidy. Well, we have the most unfair tax code you can imagine because it's all happened you know, a little ch decision here, a little decision there, and you got a group paying full taxes and you got all these special interests getting breaks. Um, so we really do have to close some of those loopholes and not create new ones. Um, so that when we see a project that we feel like we want to fund, we need to fund it in a way that we guarantee the funds only after we've seen performance. Hmm. And it just, it works like in the real world of business. <coughs> 
You don't pay until you see the benefit. Uh, I don't pay my contractor until he's finished the job. Um, well, we have to have the same attitude when we do these financial incentives in government. Mm. Well, that kind of relates to my next question, the uh, ability for special interests to uh, get tax breaks and subsidies, et cetera, often comes from uh, campaign donations. And this, of course, not only happens uh, on the state level, but on the federal level. And you uh, are co-sponsoring a resolution to support a constitutional amendment uh, to undo the Supreme Court's so-called Citizens United decision. Some of our viewers may have read your column that was widely circulated on this issue, mm -hmm. but I want to give you a chance here to explain why you feel so strongly about this and what it's all about for folks who aren't familiar with this decision. Uh, well, to cut to the core, um, Citizens United allows corporations to spend as much money as they want on any political issue um, so long as it's not directly given to a candidate, it's just spent on their own account. Um, as much money as they want as any, on any political issue or candidate that they choose. Um, and I have several problems with that. Um, one is uh, people, they're not spending, when you spend corporate money, you're spending investor money. So if I'm invested in your corporation, you're spending my money. Now, I don't necessarily choose which corporations I'm invested in. So if I'm a teacher and I'm a member of the state's ERA retirement fund, they're investing my retirement funds in companies that I don't know anything about. And then those companies are investing in political causes that may be absolutely contrary to what I believe in. And that's actually a very good example because some folks at home may not realize that in the case of that system, it's mandatory. I mean, if you're an employee uh, in a certain class in, in a university or a school district, you must exactly. be part of the pension system. So it's not a choice, truly isn't. <laughs> truly isn't. And even if, I, even if I'm not invested in the market and I don't have a pension mm -hmm. fund, uh, the state has $30 billion in state, uh, uh, state land funds and severance tax funds that are invested on citizens' behalf. So now these companies are taking government money and investing it in specific political causes. So even it affects everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely everybody. Well, whether I choose to invest or not, uh, I am invested, and I haven't signed a proxy assigning political support or my vote or my resources to be spent on a cause that I may not agree with. Um, so my argument is, is that unintentionally, Citizens United has not, not only gives corporations undue power, it has essentially usurped the individual's right of speech and given it to a corporation where I have absolutely no control over the message they're sending uh, and there are absolutely no laws in place that require approval of shareholders. And even if there were, they'd be pretty, pretty difficult and pretty weak. Um, so, you know, I have to ask, are we really willing to cede our resources to third parties that we don't choose to decide what, how our money's gonna be spent on political speech. And I think it's absolutely inappropriate, I think it's undemocratic, and we have to stop it now. Okay, very interesting, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about this, because we're gonna see the effects of Citizens United throughout the entire year. Some say we've already seen an enormous effect of this in Iowa during the Republican caucuses, with, with a barrage of negative ads from groups funded and by various sources. And it's been huge. And you know, interestingly enough, I've got right now in my wallet about five or six checks that I've gotten from companies ahead of the legislative session, political donations. And they, you know, that's a habit they, they do. I'm not a big corporate guy, so I get a lot less corporate contributions than a lot of candidates do. Um, but I had them sitting in my wallet for about a month and I just couldn't make myself deposit those dang checks. 
And uh, so I'll announce it here for the first time. I am not taking any corporate donations prior mm -hmm. to this session or coming up to the next election. I feel so strongly about this issue and I really can't in good conscience take a corporate contribution um, feeling as I do about Citizens United. So Are you concerned at all about that hampering your ability in running for re-election next year? It'll hamper me some, but I'll be quite honest with you, since I'm, uh, I'm not going to be that, uh, someone that a lot of the big corporate donors would go to anyway, uh, it's a less of a sacrifice to me than it would be for somebody else. Okay. Well, uh, speaking of influence through money, some developers, uh, folks say, have too much influence. And uh, this gets to some legislation you've proposed pass through committee, uh, and but it never has made it uh, to be able to be put into law, and that is legislation for homeowners associations, mm -hmm. giving individuals who move into a community who are forced to pay a fee to live in that community, otherwise a lien will be put on their homes, and very often they don't have any say in the homeowners association because the developer has control of that very often for an awful long time because lots especially in recent years have taken a long time to sell so there are a lot of empty lots and until they're all sold the developer controls the homeowners association well it's a big deal <laughs> and it's virtually unregulated in the state um, you know new mexico is a small state and uh, uh, you know, states that are more populous and have had more development over time um, do have certain kinds of regulations in place to a certain degree. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and blame anybody. We're, you know, slower in the development stage and putting things in place as we grow and, and the needs change. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly right now things are set up that um, the law allows uh, essentially through all kinds of, I won't get into the details, through all kinds of different mechanisms, uh, the developers to collect homeowners association fees and then essentially spend them on things that are more for the developer's benefit than for the homeowner's benefit. And so the core issue that we're trying to address through legislation, and, and me, uh, Representative Mimi Stewart introduced it last time and did a great job of pulling together a bill. Um, and um, the, the core thing that we want to accomplish is to say, gee, if a homeowner is paying to be a member of a homeowner association, the benefits of that spending need to go to the homeowner, not to a developer who controls the association. Mm -hmm. And that's the core idea behind the legislation without getting into all the, uh, the technical pieces of it. And I, I absolutely support it. And uh, it's not going to be germane this session. Uh, but certainly any time it comes up, I'll be supporting that kind Hopefully of the next session. Hopefully 2013. Again, when we have two months versus one month. Exactly, okay. and that we're not <laughs> limited to budget issues primarily. Okay, another big issue that probably will be discussed in, in some way during this session is education reform. Yes. Uh, the governor's talked an awful lot about this, and th there's an awful lot of controversy about some of the proposals. Where does, where does this all stand and, and how do you feel about it? Um, uh, I feel there's a lot of good ideas in the governor's agenda, a lot of energy and a lot of focus that's been missing in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what happens so much, um, particularly in education, is we'll spot a problem, someone comes to the legislature and says, here's a bill and give me some money to take care of this little problem. And over time, uh, we've got all these little buckets of money spent on all these individualized solutions. Um, that don't come together as effectively as they should. Hmm. Um, so that we uh, unintentionally, again, end up making a, a lot of investments that don't pay off. And we've got to get um, you know, all the oars pulling in the same direction, get a focus on a few things that are important, and that's how we can make progress. So I think the governor's really tried to push in that direction, inappropriately so. Um, Are there any specific things that the governor has proposed that you support or don't support? I mean, there have been, as you know, some that have been quite controversial, uh, whether it be uh, 
uh, not advancing uh, students. Uh, you know, there, there was a recent article uh, covered quite well about controversy relating to that. Grades for schools that have been proposed. Uh, some say that's well, a little simplistic. You. Your thoughts? I'll give you a couple of things. First of all, I supported and voted for grades for schools. Uh, because it was so complicated with no child left behind, nobody could figure out <laughs> what was going on and whether their school was succeeding or failing. And there were so many different measures that, frankly, academic performance got lost. And administrators mm -hmm. are running around taking care of 39 different measures. Well, none of us can hold 39 goals in our head and go out and achieve them all. Mm -hmm. We need to get more focused. Uh, so I think that the, um, the bill that we passed did that. It probably focuses a little more on standardized test scores than I'd like, and people criticize that a lot. Um, and there are weaknesses we need to improve. Um, but we also have to look at the other measures that are put in place, which is with all the weaknesses of the standardized testing, that's still the most objective of all the measures. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's easy to throw stones at it, but if the other measures are even, you know, less clear and more fuzzy, well, you, we got to take that into consideration. Um, regarding social promotion, that bill's going to come up again. I just was talking to Hannah Scandera, the uh, K through 12 uh, PED secretary, and um, they're going to reintroduce it. Um, the big pushback that I've always had with what they put forward is I, I supported what they were trying to do. Um, but what I didn't like was there was no funding put in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we can operate a lot more efficiently. I just explained why a couple minutes ago. Uh, but whenever you put something forward that's unfunded, it's not going to get the attention. And schools already have too many unfunded mandates. So if you really want it to happen, whether it's borrowing funds from something else, uh, wherever it comes from, you don't have to increase the budget. You have to put the money there to show that you got the focus. And the governor started now to do that. She's made a proposal. I don't know if it's enough money, uh, but it makes me want. It makes me a lot more inclined to support the measure. And what's important about the money in this case is there's lots of research that says if you hold a child back, that often results, uh, even if it's in the early grades, that often gives you a worse result than if you had promoted that child. Um, so if you hold them back, you've got to have the money to have remedial work you know, with the that prob child. Yeah, and the problem is, is that most of the time when we've held kids back in the past, and this is nationwide, they just put them back in another classroom and they do the same thing they did before. And, you know, if you repeat the same thing, you still get failure. Um, the important part about this legislation and that I've always supported uh, from the secretary and from the governor is that they have committed to, if we hold a child back, we're gonna have very specific things in place to help that child catch back up. And that in Florida, we have evidence that this actually worked. Um, so if we can fund that, and we funded it adequately, and uh, we phase into it properly, and we start working with the kids really early in kindergarten, as soon as we, we identify that they're behind, all of which the new proposal that the governor's putting forward incorporates. Now I think we got something that can really help the schools and really help the kids. So, um, you know, I'm very open to that. The devil's always in the details, but I certainly support the direction. Now let's just be sure we've husbanded the resources to make it work. Okay, well education's certainly a hot button issue and the next one is uh, even more so, and that's immigration. You have uh, introduced a bill to create a guest worker program. Tell me about this. Uh, well, first thing I'll tell you is everybody says, never introduce anything on immigration because no matter what you do, everybody's going to hate it and you're going to get thrown out of office. And uh, I have to tell you that the last two legislative sessions, the special session and the last session, the amount of time that was spent on this narrow, narrow issue of driver's licenses uh, was just ridiculous. And the amount of good public policy and issues that we should have gotten to that we didn't get to because of that issue, frankly, uh, annoyed me tremendously. And um, a lot of the, there are problems with the driver's license 
uh, th that we're doing now. A lot of people are getting federal, using it as federal ID, and they're getting licenses when they come from out of state. And we need to solve those problems. You've taken some heat on this because you you told a reporter you're inclined to support uh, the governor's position that we should not grant driver's licenses uh, to the undocumented. What exactly. do you what do you say to those? who say uh, the undocumented will drive anyway and it'll be harder to track them and they can't get insurance. Well, they are going to drive anyway uh, and uh, they can't get insurance um, and that's what's happening in 47 other states now. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is two things. First of all, in introducing a guest worker program, the basic idea is you get a guest worker status which then entitles you to get a driver's license. Mm -hmm. So. What I'm really proposing when I make my guest worker bill is that, first of all, you're going to have a status that you can be here, and then when you have a legal status, then you can get a driver's license. Uh -huh. Because I think the voter confusion and oftentimes outrage that someone who's here illegally can legally get a driver's license, it makes no sense to them. Have you asked the governor to support your bill for the guest worker program? No, and I don't believe she will support it because <laughs> she's on record so many times. But what I need to do, uh, and what I think is important, is expanding the debate to solving the real problems. Because I get a ton of email from folks think, you know, very angry about the driver's license issue. And the governor's right, and da 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 da. And they go on to say all the things that it will solve about immigration. Well, the problem is we have 47 states that do not give driver's licenses, and they all have the same immigration problems that we do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's not going to solve the problem. I think the voters are misinformed about what the driver's license issue will solve. So I'm offering the guest worker bill to say, listen, if we really want to not make lawbreakers out of employers, not make lawbreakers out of labor that we need here, but we also want to protect workers uh, from unfair competition, there's a number of things that we can do. And that's what my guest worker bill does. It says, so let's look at the whole problem and let's, let's stop making lawbreakers out of everybody unnecessarily. That's the definition of bad you, law. You, this is, as I said, such a hot button issue. Anything related to immigration, do you think that your, your bill will get uh, the chance even to get to the floor? We'll find out. I frankly is, was disappointed both in Republican and Democratic leadership mm -hmm. that they've allowed this issue to focus so tightly on driver's licenses and allow this this uh, situation to develop, which I think misleads voters. Okay. And what I've put together essentially will fund itself. It doesn't require new taxes. It, it basically takes payroll taxes. Your normal um, illegal worker invents a fake social security number to get a job, and then their payroll taxes go to the federal government. And the federal government has no valid social security number, so they keep the money. Uh, my bill basically says, well, you get a legal status, everyone pays the payroll taxes, it goes to fund our program. It doesn't ask the state to do any enforcement. It does say, before it goes into effect, it can only go into effect with agreement from the federal government. And by us, uh, by the federal government agreeing not to deport people who we've granted this worker status, it helps the federal government focus its enforcement where there's really a problem. Um, and it gives us the money to do the program and quite frankly a little more to pay for any social services that the guest workers may use. Right. So I'm just trying to come up with a logical solution that takes care of all the stakeholders. And um, you know, people, we can argue out uh, whether I've done a good job or not, but that's the process we should be going through. Okay, I want to, uh, quickly running out of time, so I want to get to one other issue that affects a lot of people in this area. There's a proposal, as you know, to reform the pension system for education employees. This includes, uh, amongst other things, a minimum retirement age of 55, uh, a restriction on cost of living increases. Where do you stand on this? Um, it seems to me it's appropriate. Uh, there have been a couple problems going on. We, there are pretty generous benefits compared to anything else you look at out there. 
um, either competing states or the private sector. Um, but that's, uh, to some extent, that's okay because our teachers do pay in a lot. Um, do you think this has a chance to, to pass? Uh, there was a previous reform proposal that did not. Well, this seems to have gotten a lot of support. Um, uh, the the uh, para group, or excuse me, the ERA. ERB. ERB, ERB, thank you. Education Retirement Boards learned from that experience and went out and got a lot more input from folks and from teachers. What are you hearing from other legislators? Is this going to gain support, a wide support amongst the legislature? I haven't really had a lot of chance to talk about it, uh -huh. but I have to say that, that we've only got three choices. One, invest more from the general fund to make it solvent, mm -hmm. cut back on the benefits, or increase the teachers' contributions. And um, to be able to retire at 40 and then maybe come back and double dip, a lot of, a lot of the public's not real happy with that. Um, 55 retirement age doesn't seem unreasonable to me. That's good compared to just about everything else out there in the world. So um, I think that it'll get a good careful look and it has a good chance of passing because uh, we really don't want an insolvent retirement fund for teachers. They deserve better. Absolutely not. All right. Senator Steve Fishman, uh, the debut of your legislators. Good luck in Santa Fe. Thank you. Thank you. Your Legislators is a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Copyright New Mexico State University Board of Regents.